exactly. Yeah, that's well, brothers and sisters. I want to I want to get us started with Psalm 119. This is the longest psalm in the Bible um, because mm -hmm. there are eight stanzas for each letter of the alphabet in the Jewish alphabet. So there are 22 sections of it of eight verses. And it is what, so when Psalms are written in the acrostic, it's a letter of the alphabet starts each line or each verse, or, or in this case, each stanza. So this is an acrostic and it's all dedicated to the grandeur and the necessity of divine teaching. So this is one small section, and I'll read you a little bit more of it. There's not many notes to it in the discussion, but hear how important it is to study and learn the word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. Amen and amen. Oh. And that is our welcome to the Bible at St. James, Bible study at St. James Presbyterian Church here on the corner of 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue in the village of Harlem, in the city of New York. And we are in the session room rather than the sanctuary because the session room has air conditioning. Hey. Amen and amen. Amen, yes. So hear amen. more about this Psalm 119, which, which has these eight sections of 22 verses or something like that. And it's the longest Psalm in the Bible. As I said before, all of Psalm 119 speaks to the grandeur grandeur and the necessity of divine teaching. Remember, one of the things about the Psalms is that it helps you to teach, teach the word, it helps you to teach ways of being and teach the understanding of the joys and the beauties and the lament in our, in our understanding of our relationship with God. And this one is a, the entire Psalm is an individual petition that the Lord's teaching in Hebrew, of course, it's the Torah, and very often when we use our Bible, the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version, it's read as law. It guides one's every moment in danger and discouragement. That's why the word is so important. It guides one's every moment in joy and exultation. I told you that it is an acrostic. Each of the 22 stanzas begins with the successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And each stanza has eight verses. And usually, each, each verse has eight synonyms for the word law. More accurately, they are like authoritative, pre, or more or accurately thought of law as, we think about law as something, it's a prescriptive, you have to do this. Law really means authoritative teaching. So we have law, word, promises, ordinances, statute, yes commandments, decrees, and precepts. So every one of these eight stanzas, every one of these eight verse stanzas will have some of these synonyms that, have, um, that speak to the law. And here is a meaning chart for our mindset to think about this. When we're thinking about illumination, we hear the words law and word. When we're thinking about a moral demand, we're thinking ordinances, statutes and commandments. And when we're talking about guidance, we're talking about decrees and precepts. And a promise is of course a promise. The Psalm presumes that human life involves continual conflict with evil. 
with definitive victory lying only in the future. The major weapon for the battle against evil is the divine word, for its observance trains the passions, gives strength and temptation, and elevates the mind to God. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, I write all this stuff and type all this stuff and read all this stuff. And when you say it out loud, it's like, whoa, that's deep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if we have in words in what 105, your word is a lamp into my feet. Um, your ordinances in, in 106. It's 107, your word. 108, ordinances. 109, law. 110 precepts, 111, decrees, 112, statutes. Mm -hmm. So we hear these guiding ways of understanding. I would love to take this and when, and to write, rewrite this for young people when they say, why in the world do we have to read the Bible and study the word, but to figure out how we can get across to them that, um, that the major weapon for the battle against things in life is understanding that the word and observing the word will help us train our passions and to help us to be able to discern how to move forward. And it'll give us strength when we find that we're weak and that whenever we are thinking about God, our minds are, are elevated to God because we're thinking about God's divine word. I love this song. Mm -hmm. One day I'll just have to read the entire thing out loud because it's they're all just different variations of this. It's beautiful. Any thoughts on Psalm 119 verses 105 through 12 now that I've given you the academic understanding of it and some of my own spiritual um, notions of it? What do you think it means by I am severely afflicted? Do you think that it's just kind of taken a moment of like how we how we handle temptation yeah or... and, that, and once again that this remember that the psalm presumes that in human life there's nothing but continual conflict with evil okay and that we are always underneath some sort of oppression or something that is evil in the world and that we are always severely afflicted and give me life and so that when we're afflicted rather than giving into the affliction we say no, give me life according to your word, because your word promises life. Okay. That's what I, that's what I'm, I'm reading. You see it as. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's encouraging, you know, I think um, it's like a map. Mm -hmm. it's, it shows, you know, it, it just, um, you know, affirms that everything that you'll come up against, if you look into the word and read it, and then try to live it on each one of these different life circumstances that you, you can't go wrong as long as you continually study and try to live according to the word. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I look at incline my heart to perform your statutes, which, you know, we all have a heart to learn more. Mm -hmm. We do. Perform them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I know that there may not be an answer to this, but I just want to ask you, because I'm trying to just hear from, from your voices of this. Um, what does it mean to, to, to hear that there's a difference between the way that we may have possibly heard the word law and the way that we think about it in the 21st century, as opposed to it meaning authoritative teaching? Hmm. Because we 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 we've been reading a lot of Paul lately, right? And Paul right. has been talking about law, 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 and the law is this authoritative teaching that he's talking about. And most of the times when we hear the word about you know you must follow the law and the law is you must follow the laws and the rules of the Torah. We look at it as if you don't follow the law then there's a punishment for it. Right. But what about what happens when you don't follow the authoritative teaching? You go off of the pathway of, of wisdom, right? 
Mm -hmm. So there is this whole notion of really shaking ourselves up from our understanding that the law that we talk about is not synonymous with the law that means authoritative teaching. Our laws in this country are not authoritative teaching because we're always right. questioning them, right? right? We're always right. taking it to the Supreme Court. We're always trying to trying to fight how do, what do these laws really, really, really mean? They're not authoritative. Mm -hmm. Our laws are always debatable. That's why we always have the swinging back and forth of, of, of Supreme Court oh, judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why we always have when people say, well, the statute was, it was said in this statute in 1832, and that's what we're going to go by until somebody, <laughs> makes, another, until somebody makes another um, uh, statute or precept, right? And I think most of our laws and rules fly in the face of the authoritative teaching. Right. And, and so they don't align. Many, not all, but right. many do not. And so it drives your thinking away from the authoritative teaching of the word of God and moves you in another direction of right and wrong according to the flesh. That's like how that. I say it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, what, and I love the fact, I'm thinking about this even more now because in our denomination, um, for those who aren't Presbyterian, we have this constitution and this constitution it changes every couple of years and if we were to look at that constitution as an authoritative teaching to guide us but you go into so many meetings and it says well the book of sessions said, the book of order says we have to do this and we have to do that and rather than allowing it to be an authoritative teaching that guides us into how we interact with one another and how we allow the spirit um, to guide us through the teaching um, and we may get it wrong sometimes, and other times we'll get it right. But it takes away some of the the acrimony. That's that's what I think gets me about the difference between authoritative teaching and law, is that there is a privilege saying a privileged authority in saying that I am saying what the law is, rather than saying we are meant to to discern what this authoritative teaching is teaching us and how to be a community. Mm -hmm. right. Well, and I think that has to do with the power structure, too, because mm -hmm. <laughs> in the authoritative teaching, the power goes to those who are in need and those who are at the other um, strata of who we see as being important and powerful. And people will say, well, the bylaws say, mm -hmm. and they, they always forget that it only takes a meeting. Right. Change the bylaws. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, we get caught in that too. Yeah, yeah. we get caught in that too. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. We do. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The bylaw, instead of instead of being able to say, well, what does the, what does the teaching allow us to look at this in a different perspective? But I think I I do think that you know it's the flexibility that gets some people crazy. They want a, a black or a white. Oh it's yeah, this or this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They want either this or this. And, you know, but, um, you know, I, I think in the space of, um, I don't know, somehow we got into a conversation about membership and what makes a member. And then, then the membership goes into, you know, well, are they tithing? And then that goes into, well, okay, well, how do we know they're tithing? But then if you think about the authoritative teachings of Jesus, you gave what you could give. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that some of the some of some of the biblical figures couldn't give any more than a couple pennies. And they and still even, even in even in that instance, it wasn't so much that the widow gave her last might. In that instance, it was more the fact that the ones who were making a big deal about all the money that they were given weren't following the law to take care of widows and orphans. There's no way a widow should have to give her last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never, <laughs> yes. I, you know what, last week I, that I was thinking about that, um, what you had said, was, it, you know, I, I never heard it, um, you know, taught that way. Mm -hmm. you know? Never, mm -hmm. never. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a lot in that power structure, structure because, you know, 
being, you know, again, being one of the trustees, I, you know, sometimes I can put on the financial hat, which I do have to say, um, okay, well, there are more people coming, but uh, the bills have to get paid. Amen. <laughs> yeah, some people, so. some, some churches would do that. They'll count, oh, we got to get more members in here because they feel like they're going to get more money, you know. Well, yeah, because yeah. the money keeps people, the doors open. People, yeah, dollar, dollar signs, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the lights aren't free anywhere. Not, not in New York, you know? Edison. No, not not here. No, no, and, not and you Clinton. know, yep. Yeah. So there's, I think those things kind of, you know, somehow come into play, and you know, well, you know I, but I, I think that's important. I was talking with Emma Jordan Simpson of Auburn Seminary, the president, and um, I was sharing with her um, that in our in our book of order, we have what we call a ministry of members. And it sort of just defines the ministry of members. And there are certain sections in our book of order that I just believe are beautiful writings. And in the ministry of members, um, I presented that to the session and the session actually voted that this is a member in good standing is following through with what this ministry of members is. The, the giving is one part of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's the studying, it's the being in community. That's right. And the last, there's a whole last section that's all about making sure that you are doing the work, that you become a better part, that you become in better relationship with God, and that, that you are answering that call and that you're looking at your life and looking at how you're performing your life in community and as a child of God and as a member of the church and as a church community member in the world and how you are in the world and all of that. Mm -hmm. is what a member is right and I, and so we have we have posters of it all over the place well, well that's that's <laughs> that's interesting because uh we are now you know in a big struggle with our pastor which is really mm -hmm. and the conversation now is what is a member in good standing and here we go again back into that same conversation and uh matter of fact donna washington just sent me some some language on, um, you know, a member in good standing and, you know, and what about the guys who are, you know, there, we, we always have some people that are my kids included. That's the only church I ever, <laughs> you know, Macedonia. And if anything had Macedonia is my church. So these conversations are going on, you know, and it just makes it touchy. It makes it touchy. Um, you know, especially when you're in times of conflict. Yeah. Who can vote? Who can't vote? Well, they're not really mm -hmm. a this. Not, I, it just gets edgy, you know, not because of the authoritative teaching by a long shot <laughs> by the flesh. Well, St. James is very much like that. And I'm sure Church of the Master and other churches are as well. People have been coming. They said, somebody even said this on Saturday. They're like, wow, I grew up in the church and I haven't been here in 40 years. Oh, but I'm still a <laughs> member. I'm like, no, you're exactly. not. <laughs> I'm exactly. Like, exactly. Yeah, I bless your heart. Your, your membership, right. your spirit, you're a spiritual member, but right. you're not on our rolls. <laughs> but let me right. let me tell you, let me tell you this one. Right. That we was having an election one time, and um the person had um um you know when a person when you get elected, you are elected, you still have to go through a certain process in order to be, you know, um to actually become the officer. So the person was was not a member, as they said, was not a member. So all this discussion went on, and then a person finally came out and said, but you've been taking my money. Oh. <laughs> yeah, all these tricky. years, you've been taking my money. <laughs> I, I nearly, I nearly it's fell tricky. off because a pin, a pin dropped on the floor. <laughs> right, right, right. And you right. can hear a pin drop. Right. Yep. The first thing it was, you got a point. <laughs> you, gotta, you know, I mean, I, it it just gets fleshly, as best I can say, Reverend <laughs> Derek. It, it just gets fleshly, and it takes us away from the actual authoritative tr teaching, um, and and that's something to think about, definitely. Yeah, but the, to try to deny someone that's willing to serve, you know, and, and you know, once they once if they if they have been elected, then they just go through the process that you have to send them through but to deny them to even be, to be elected <laughs> yeah 
that's yeah. um, a lot of spaces. Yep. Now we we last week. Now we're, we're moving on to our first reading in Genesis. So we've gone from getting Isaac on the altar, <laughs> and now he's he's off the altar, and now he's married. He's, he's doing like that woman in color purple. I was married now. I was married now. <laughs> he's married people. <laughs> I says married now. So we're going to hear some of this priestly story for a couple of verses about now the generation. Remember, Abraham, his legacy is firmly implanted. And now we get to the section of the Bible where we start talking about how this is growing. These are the descendants of Isaac in Genesis 25, 19 through 34. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And the two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger when her time came to get when her time to give birth was at hand there were twins in her womb the first came out red all his body like a hairy mantle so they named him esau afterward his brother came out with his hand gripping esau's e heel and so he was named isaac Jacob, sorry, and he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. When the boys, boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking his stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff I'm, for I'm famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die of what use is a birthright to me. Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. I was telling Reverend Pond, who's at a board of trustees meeting today with the Presbyterian, that this scripture is the basis for my um, master's thesis. Mm. And my master's thesis was, was about Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> Malcolm and Martin, you know, um, two twins from the same mother. Um, the mother being the black church, if you remember, right. Malcolm X's mm -hmm. father was a minister. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. And it came to me only because what was Malcolm's nickname? What was the, I don't know. Red. Red. Oh, oh, okay. Right. He had right, a red afro. Right, right. And then I started yeah, thinking book. about it and he, you know, he was older. He's older than Martin. So these two brothers from the same church and, you know, it would it should have been Malcolm X that had the, the birthright to go ahead and to sort of like lead this new movement and sort of how, how Martin came along and Ma Martin was more refined and sort of more genteel and, and homed mm -hmm. and not in the, of the streets and so on and so forth of the, of the wilderness. 
And mm -hmm. so I use that analogy. Um, oh, wow. That, that must have been some grief there. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the, the other thing is that I found out in that text that when there's something, there's something about this, there's a reddish, the redness of, of Esau's um, body when he came out is usually in twins, there's a weaker twin um, in, yes. in, the, in the case when that, and when the weaker twin um, needs blood and needs energy, it usually comes from the stronger twin. And because mm. all of the all of the things that are being taken from the stronger twin, that twin usually comes out flush and red. Mm. So even within the womb, Jacob is 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 sucking from from Esau, mm. the sucking from life from Esau in order to survive. Mm. Well, I am a mother of twins. I know you are. <laughs> I know you are. Yeah. So you know I, which to speak. Yeah. I mean, I one twin was bigger than the other twin, mm -hmm. even though they're identical. So they both are in the same sack. When they're fraternals, they're indifferent. Yeah. So, and do I think one, yeah, one's a little stronger than the other, depending on what you're looking at. Yeah. You know, they're, you know, but. But certainly through most of their lives, the one that came, he's a minute in front of the other. Um, I'll say stayed on the straight and narrow better yeah. than the other twin, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I get you. I get you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The other twin had a little bit more, you know, challenging a time. I'll say that. And so I could sort of kind of, but very, very close. They're still. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Because they. They literally have been able to have conversations where one starts and the other finishes. So that's been a time. Yeah. It's just an interesting thing. Huh. You so know, just this is this this mm -hmm. thus begins the story of Jacob and his family. Hmm. And the book of this section I of I am a twins. <laughs> what? I am a twins. Twins. Oh, you are? You're, you're a twin too? I didn't know DT, that. You're a twin? Yes, yes, I am twins. twins. A boy, another boy, another girl. Oh, that was a boy. Okay. You have twins? twins. Or you are a twin? I am a twins. You, you are a twin. A twin. Mm -hmm. And your other, your twin is a boy. Yes. Okay, identical. Nope. Are you identical? Okay, you're fraternal. Yes. Okay. Wow. All right. They're still close. They're very. My mom. Is a, the... My mom is a twin. She's a twin. That's right. Your mom's a twin, Pat. So this reading in Genesis twenty-five nine through fourteen, thirty-four, it's it starts the whole story of Jacob and his family, and the the, the bulk of the section of Genesis goes back to the early traditions of Jacob whose name is also synonymous with what? Israel. He is the father of the Israelite tribes, Jacob. Though many originated as ancient Israelite oral traditions, this written version of Jacob shows multiple connections to places that were important in the Northern Kingdom of Israel. And this likely sort of started here. So this is the introduction of the descendants of Isaac, but it's important to remember that with, with Isaac and Ishmael, Ishmael goes off and then Isaac is now, now ready to sort of start his whole story and his story starts the nation of Israel. So it starts Abraham's nation and his, his, his people of Israel and his 12 tribes become the 12 sons of Jacob, right? So that's what that's all about. Um, the other interesting thing that I can I can sort of project and let you know about this whole issue of the birthright being stolen and being taken. Jacob, after all of his trickery and everything that he does and he goes through with his whole issue with Jacob and Esau, when he has his 12 children, he does not give precedent 
of the first birthright, of the, of the birthright to the first child. He shares it among them all. He's learned his lesson from this, from this little incident that happened. Mm -hmm. um, so this, when Rebecca says, these children are, are struggling within me. If it's to be this way, God, why do I live? She was ready to go. Um, but it presupposes that there's this ancient practice of seeking a divine oracle at a local sanctuary. So she would have gone somewhere and said, speak to me, Lord, Oracle, please speak to me and let me know why am I even living if I'm going to have this much trouble? And the Lord said to her, you don't have just one nation in your room. You have two. And they're going to be divided. And one shall be stronger than the other. And the elder shall serve the younger. Um, this Hebrew word for red Admoni is a play of the word Edom that we see in verse 30. Harry uh, Sayar is a play on Seir, which is a region in which where the Edomites live. So they're putting this whole narrative together to talk about this group of Edomites um, that, that supposedly come from Esau that sort of are in rivalry with, 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 um, with um, Jacob's people and Jacob's um, children in the way that he brought people forth. Jacob, which probably means may God protect, is interpreted here by a play on the Hebrew word for heal. He takes the heel of, of his brother as he's coming out, right? He grips the heel, which usually means in Hebrew, he supplants or he takes over, he takes his place. So even it's planned from birth that when he grabs his heel, that he is supplanting him as well. So it's very interesting that all of this stuff is written into the text in terms of how the, what this means for the people. Verses 27 through 28, does that remind you of anybody else in, in the book of Genesis in chapter 16? Um, one is a hunter and a man of the field and the other one is a quiet one living at home. Mm -hmm. Cain and Abel. Cain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The narrative plays on the tension between the older and the younger brother and their lifestyles. Rebecca loved Jacob and Isaac loved Esau. Um, 29 to 34, Jacob is buying Esau's birthright with a simple stew. It, um, the birthright refers to the extra right, of course, that normally goes to the elder. Um, leadership of the family and a double share of the inheritance. So not only does the older son um, get more money, but they also become the father of the household. And they, get, they become the leader of the household and they get a double share of the inheritance, which is why what? The prodigal son is such a big, big deal, right? That's that it refer. It makes us think back to this because the prodigal son wants his share and he goes out mm -hmm. and spends it. And the father says to the older son, what does he say to him? Why are you so upset? All that I have is yours. Mm -hmm. So they're still talking. Right. So this is the power of this birthright. Um, and the way that I read it here tonight it, it seems like two brothers almost just sort of like doing a brotherly thing. Um, give me some of that food. I'm hungry. Shoot. Give me some of that that you're making. Sell me your birthright first. <laughs> I'm about mm -hmm. to die of what uses a birthright to me. And then mm -hmm. it gets serious. No, swear to me first. Yeah. Okay, sure. Here's my birthright. And then he eats. Um, but the issue, one of the issues here that they talk about, um, this caricature of Esau as a dull person, which is, I think in writing that today, it made me read that with a little bit more of a brotherly relationship between the two, um, because it's a caricature of Esau that many um, academic folks say, he's a dull-witted person, he's a person of the field, he's a brute. So he, of course he would sell something or a bowl of stew is just what he wants in the moment. Esau is often portrayed as being very um, impetuous and living for the moment, uh, this joie de vivre of living for the moment. 
and that that is to intended to explain Israel's domination of Edom historically as we move forward in second kings first and second kings there is this play between Israel and Edom and Edom is is conquered by Israel and it's basically trying to let you think that from these from this one transaction that there was this dullard of a son who was impetuous who was could only think about feeding his belly and so on and so forth and that that they were outwitted by by the Israelites and this is to bear that down and to allude to that um, but we remember that this is only the first I'm sure this will come up in another lectionary study probably this year this these next couple of weeks but just always remember in the story that this is just the first part. It's the birthright that he sells. So it's transactional. It's about money and it's about, and it's about the leadership. It's about inheritance and, and inheritance of all the, all the goods that you're owed and inheritance of leadership of the community and of, of all the property and all the sheep and all that other stuff. But later on, Esau still has a blessing that comes from his father. And that's where things get sticky. But this is the first instance of that. Um, but it's the second one that his mother is a part of, um, of the trickery that becomes the true nature of the split of these two brothers. Hmm. One last thing I'll tell you about, these brothers do come together um, and there's a beautiful uh, midrash that talks about why are people of Israel called the stiff-necked people. And it's that when Isaac and Esau finally came back together, that Esau, that, that Isaac and Esau came running towards one another and their hearts were overwhelmed with love for one another and missing one another. But the closer that they got, Esau was even more angry and started to remember everything that he had been th that he had been through and that by the time he got up to his brother, he was so angry that he went to go bite his neck. Mm. And God turned Jacob's neck into stone. Mm. So that Esau broke his teeth. Mm. And they wept in one another's arms for love. And that is why the people of Israel are stiff necked people. <laughs> that's a good one isn't that a good one that's a good one that's a good one that's a good one so when we talk about the, the when we talk about we were just talking about the law and talking about um interpretation of the law in the hebrew text there is no room for real sort of like interpretation so when you read the torah even when even when you see people they don't like you know how like sometimes we write notes in the margins or like we'll cross, underline a word and in the hebrew torah the tradition is to only write around the corners of the words but to never sort of write an interpretation of it um within the text because it has to stand sacrosanct so the midrash um are more like commentaries that were written a thousand years like in about um in the medieval time period um, of all of these rabbis that were sort of giving all these backstories to that. So that's why I wanted to share that with you as well. Um, so what do you think about this reading of um, uh, Jacob and Esau and Isaac and Rebecca, like, you know, Isaac married a woman like his mother, a woman who couldn't conceive, right? Right, right. Uh, what a, what, it gave me a reflection on, <clears throat> and our, uh, a situation like uh, uh, back uh, home, there is a saying that if you cannot stand hunger, you cannot stay in a city because um, uh, many many other times you will not be able to find food to eat like you are in a village. So, so, <laughs> so <laughs> and, the, and the opportunities that in the city are more of than the opportunities in the village. To eat. So, at the time people come from the village, uh, they will come to the city. They want to go to school in the city, or they will come and live with their uncle or aunts. And then, sometimes the aunt will not even cook because she doesn't have the money. Uh, sometimes uncle will not have the money, and there will no 
there will be no food in the home. So like that, those guys will run away and go back. To, they'll go back to the village because they cannot back stay to the village. Give me some they, cannot too. they cannot study hunger. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. I mean, it's the idea of them being dull with, with it, which is, I'm assuming means he, he just, uh, he didn't figure out what his, his brother was doing. You know, mm -hmm. even though, you know, the brother might have had some, you know, un, you know, the, he might have just had some intentions from the beginning, but um, that that that's a very interesting sort of a thing to use food. And he is so famished that he would give his birthright up for that. I mean, that's pretty hungry. So I also think that um, when I think about brotherly relationships. But also, and, and when I think about, I should say, sibling relationships, you know, in a moment like that, it's sort of like, come on, stop playing. You know, this isn't really serious stuff that we're talking about. Oh, okay. yeah. so, so you're going to get everything, big deal. Right. I'm going to go off and I'm going to make my riches as well. So sure, you can have all this stuff. You know, I don't want to sit in a tent like you are. I'm going to go out and make my own out there in the field kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, then it, but the tone sort of switches for me when he says, swear. <laughs> yeah, then it becomes serious, right? Because it doesn't seem so serious in the very beginning. You know, he's just coming in from, you know, hunting, and all yeah. of a sudden he throws this real serious proposition: give up, give me your birthright. What for a bowl for a, a bowl of lentils? And, yeah. So that's yeah. So he supplants. Mm -hmm, he does. It almost makes it seem like a sort of a it has sort of a mythological air to it. Doesn't it though? It does. Mm -hmm. I think that's why the allusion to to Cain and Abel um, yeah. is a powerful one as well. A powerful one. It shows that mythological tension um, mm -hmm. between older and younger, who's loved more by mother, who's loved more by right. daddy. All by these death. things are in there, you know? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Who's more, who's more, as they would say in mythological terms, who's more virile um, and who's more, more, you know, it's like Aaron, me and my brother Aaron and I, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm of the home, I'm of the tent, I'm in the books, Aaron's in the military, Aaron's a football star, Aaron's yes, a wrestler, <laughs> I'll, I'll you know, I'd be like, yeah. Aaron, sell me this, I'll make you, I'll make you, a bit, I'll make you a plate of pancakes if you, yeah, 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 yeah. you were very different, I'll say that. Yeah, in, yeah. In almost every way, almost. <laughs> but I, I just love this. The elder shall serve the younger. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I also think that this whole idea about, you know, Rebecca being in so much pain and actually saying, just take my life. Why am I living? Right. Yeah. You know, um, mm -hmm. and the first one came out red, all his body mm -hmm. like a hairy mantle. Mm -hmm. So they named him Esau. Mm -hmm. One who is. And, and what's Esau? What's what's the Hebrew? Is Esau? Does that name mean anything? I forget what it means. I thought I just. I thought I saw. Yeah, I, I, for some reason I thought I thought that was meant red. No. I think. Let me just double check. The, the Hebrew word for red is admoni. Right. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, that's what he said earlier. But I, I was just. That's uh, what I kind of thought about. What chapter is this? Twenty-five, twenty-five. Huh. It doesn't say. Okay. But it, it is some allusion to him being red that I that okay. we can say. It, it's an allusion to him being red and him being hairy. Okay. Yeah. So here we are. 
So that's Jacob and Esau in the beginning of the nation of Israel. It's so funny because the even the the precursor to the beginning of the nation of Israel, the the generation before that is one of tension, where the people split with the blessing of of Abraham. And so I I always am. am very interested in this early part of the Torah, Genesis. It's like people are trying to get things right. So like Cain and Abel, there was murder. Jacob and Esau, well, it was a little less. It was a birthright and a blessing. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Um, so so um, Isaac and Ishmael, Isaac and Ishmael, uh, one is banished <laughs> and one is almost sacrificed. Jacob and Esau, it's not so bad, but they are separated, but they do come back together and it's, but they're still, you know, so there's like, everything sort of gets a little less um, tragic as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Like we're learning how to get it right. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was mentioning the importance of like Jacob saying, oh, well, I'm going to give all 12 of my children equal access. Right. 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 Trying to get it right. 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 Well, I, I hope evolution with man gets that way. <laughs> Follow the same pattern. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Maybe I'll go home and make some lentil stew tonight. Hmm. <laughs> so, and now we're going to go back to our Romans text. Romans. Um, this is this section of reading is what God has done for humanity. And we're going to go into this this next section of these two readings together, and I'm going to really be leaning heavily on you for your thoughts and your meditations, especially as we get into the gospel. But hear this, Romans 8, verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin. He condemns sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. For those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death. To set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. Since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Go on ahead being deep again. I love this phrase, therefore now no condemnation. Um, there's a, what's that song? Um, I've got the joy, 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 joy down to my heart. Yes. And there's this phrase in there is like, for there is therefore now no condemnation. <laughs> in my heart. It's always a tongue twister. But Oh, this is the wrong word here. Can I edit this word immediately. Mm. Therefore, no more, therefore, now no condemnation means we are released 
from the, subs from the subservience to sin, death, and the flesh, and from deserved condemnation. So that means, if you remember from last week, we were talking about how we are slaves to sin. This is what Paul's idea is. We are slaves to sin. We are subservient to sin. And now we are released from that subservience to sin, death, and the flesh. And so we now, the, 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 with, with sin, death, and the flesh, there is condemnation. And we are released from that deserved condemnation if we are in Christ Jesus. Because Christ Jesus is the new environment God offers humanity to inhabit. Mm -hmm. Woo! Yes. So we are released because we are in Christ. The law of Christ, remember the authoritative teaching, refers to the principle or ruling function of the Holy Spirit in the domain of Christ. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is what says. Uh, Rebbe, I want to ask a question. <clears throat> Can I go ahead? Go ahead. Uh, is, uh, I just want to know, is, it's kind of difficult. I, I cannot get my head around this question. Uh, why is it that Jesus Christ didn't have sex? I have no idea. We have no clue what that, what anything happened among that, that was not written about, it was not written down about. That would be a total conjecture on my part. And that is not a, a not a focus of the gospel and of the, of the history of Jesus Christ. So I'm not sure about that. And I'm not sure about why we would, why we would think that that would be a part of, um, it's not a part of, it's not, it was never introduced as a part of the, a part of Jesus teaching in the gospel. He was concerned more about um, the way that we live our lives um, according to one another and according to God's precepts and the authoritative teaching of God. So I can't really answer that. And um, I don't conjecture that to be posited as something that um, that's a, that's a, that's a more of a theological um, mankind question than it is as more of a humankind question than it is a theological question because it's not really um one of the one of the precepts that's sort of talked about in the gospel and when we follow the gospel of christ it's really all that we have um but in actuality we don't have a the the, the gospel that we have and the the learnings that we have of christ are not historical biographical documentation there are stories of the ministry of Christ and the words of Christ as heard from his disciples um, about what it meant for Christ to come for us to be um, claimed by God and to be relieved from um, sin and death. Hmm. So that's mm -hmm. not a satisfying answer, but it is the only answer that I have. It's an interesting sort of a thing because um there are parts of the Bible where they speak to things like, you know, a, you know, adultery. They use different language for it and mm -hmm. fidelity and that type of thing. Like it goes in and out on some of those subjects sometimes, but it generally tends to be when there is something that is a conflict leading to a story that will be a major biblical figure in the movement of, mm -hmm. of, of, the movement of, of Christ and, and his disciples. So um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm thinking, uh, DT, that, that you know, in, in its spaces, it, it selects certain times to, to bring in different topics like that. Not that it's ever explicit, but, but you can infer. And, uh, but only for certain, it seems to be, um, certain biblical figures because of a some sort of motive is there. They're, they're putting some sort of, you know, uh, theme or motive that they are trying to reveal in the story and in the teachings and in what they're trying to share as these figures lived in their lives and their times. So it's very, it's a very interesting sort of a thing. It's not that it's not ever mentioned for different figures because it sort of is. Um, 
especially when it comes to a power dynamic um, yeah. that is that is that is being an overpowering of someone or another way. Yes. Yes. Especially even like with the woman with the adultery, um, when right. Jesus is writing on the ground. Yes. That's what I'm. Yeah. Which one of you has thrown the first stone? Well, in order for her to to be an adulteress, um, there has to be a male adulterer that's out there in right. the crowd as well. Absolutely. Right. Right. Yes. And that's right. the language it kind of uses. Is that you know from that one singular event that they're trying to bring to light and so it could be that you know um, those types of events did not bring those kind of events that are significant in his life in jesus christ's life that you know uh fits in 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 showing how his disciples lived historically how people lived but more to the story of how did jesus Christ come to life and save others. So I don't know. I, I kind of look at it that way. And, and there's also the and, the, and DT, if, it, if it's also helpful to you as well, um, is to, to think about Jesus being, not being married, you know, um, and that whole, that whole idea of, of, of propagating and having, and having, and having sexual relations, um, with the with the holiness and the structures that upon which he was raised and that he was holding on to of uh, that meaning that you are in a relationship and that you're married and so on and so forth and so there would be no need to him and he, he was more married to his ministry um and like we know that joseph was a much older man than than mary um who knows not not who knows what would have happened but that was not the trajectory of his life to be to be to have that be an offshoot of of what he needed to address with his ministry, his his goal. Well, I'll put it this way. It, it actually, it actually answers it for you. Thank you for asking the, this question because now this now answers it. For what God has done, God has done with the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Um, by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. It says that this alludes to God's son's complete identification with the human predicament and the human issues, but without having to be identical to us. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, you, your question really, Paul sort of answers in here, because I was thinking of it in terms of the gospel, but Paul answers it in a theological sense of saying, God's son does have complete identification with everything that are that is part of humanity, but he's not identical to us. So that that is not that's not the issue for him and it and it helps to free us for when we get involved in that sin because Christ understands it so he knows exactly for what we need to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. So are you saying in essence that he would not have just kind of sort of simplify what you're saying in essence he may not have had the same fleshly desires as that's the ordinary very, that, man theologically many of the early er, many of the early persons who study who study christ and the monks and the ascetics um they all ascribe to that and paul even ascribes to that, that that's what the purpose is when paul says don't marry he's saying all of this stuff because he wants us to say that that's that those desires distract us, distract us from where we need to be of our holiness. It's like, and if you are distracted by that, then by all means get married. That's what Paul says. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's what he says. He says if, if you can, don't take, yeah. don't take a partner. Right. Don't take a don't right. get married. Right. But but by all means, if you must get married, mm -hmm. because it, it's the it's so the desire and the and the, the desire for the fullness of the life in god and the life in christ would be something that that jesus was jesus had other other business to which he needed to attend but that wasn't part of the purview of his desires and and all of those other not just sexuality but all those other fleshly things like like taking something and taking more like like the gospel like the, like feed the feed the five thousand i'll get mine later i'm not going to eat mine first and then let everybody else get it because that's not that's not who I am. I'm, I'm, I have other things that I'm more concerned about. So those, those weren't in the purview 
of what many of the characterizations of many people who have studied and who have been aesthetics and who have, who have preyed on and, and worked throughout the centuries. Or, or drink to excess because mm -hmm. there's plenty of wine back then. Right, right, right. <laughs> but that was not one of the things that he, you know, that he, um, you know, he did to excess because he, the human, the flesh part of him, he felt, but again, who he was spiritually and what he was moving along as his message did not, of course, align with that. And, and this Bible speaks very clearly about drinking wine, but drinking it to excess. It also speaks to, you know, if you have those feelings, I guess if Jesus had those feelings for someone, it does speak very clearly um, that, you know, even if they're in your mind, then you should marry. And the whole idea of, of how I believe that that plays out in ministry very often for me is that um, there are lots of things that we can do, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that we ought to do, do them. And, and I'm not saying that in terms of right or wrong and should or could, I'm saying ought to, because I'm a firm believer that if, if you're having an issue with something that is keeping you from focusing on your relationship with God, and for keeping you from being the best that you can be in the in the in the community in which you find yourself, then that's then that's something that you have to work on. And for many people, some people can have a glass of wine. Some people mm -hmm. can't have can't. a glass of wine right. because mm -hmm. it distracts them. It distracts mm -hmm. them from what it is that they need to do. They don't go to work. They don't think about mm -hmm. about about who they're supposed to be. That I had a confession just on Sunday about that. Is it keeping me from? A person said it's keeping me from being who I needed to be. And God called mm -hmm. me to be in church today because I know that I need to address that. Mm -hmm. And it, and it wasn't about I'm just stuck on it. It's just like it's keeping me from being the best person that I can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I believe that some of the, I think that's when things become vices and, and when we, when we really fall into sin with them is because we, we have no control over them. Then we become the slave to them, which is what Paul is saying. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a, that's a yeah. deep, yeah. deep way of moving Deep question. Forward. Great question. Great question. <laughs> um, but we are not of the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. This is where Paul, um, in his chapters, after he's talking about all this stuff about flesh and sin and being subservient and, and being released and, you know, God really loving you. If you're, if you're, you know, when we move more towards how Jesus Christ is calling us to be, and when we move away from, from the law of the flesh into the law of the spirit, there's this joyful thing. We're not of the flesh, we're in the spirit because the spirit of God dwells in us. Mm. We have accepted that we've said yes to that. So this is a beautiful thing and that we will be raised. And even though these simple bodies that we have, even though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit of life is because of righteousness. Remember I said, first century thought was that there was really hardly any way to escape the flesh and that the flesh was bad and that the flesh was sin. But when we are raised up through Christ, we are raised up again and our, our new mortal bodies are given the clearness and the cleanness and the freshness that can never be given when we are beholden to this earthly life. Mm -hmm. That's the belief back then. Okay. Okay. In our gospel lesson, Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9, verses 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the crowd, the whole crowd, stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables saying, listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some feed, seeds fell on the path and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. 
and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. Since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and those the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds uh, fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. If such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. Hmm. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. But as for the what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. There's something that happens between this two pericope, but this is the, the one where this is being explained. Jesus tells the parable, which becomes a mystery to folks. And then he explains it in terms of what it means in terms of the kingdom of God. Mm. But he uses these parables that Jesus tells according to the groups in which he's, to which he's speaking are spoken specifically because these are people that know, this is part of the agrarian community that he's speaking to, that know what it means when you're farming. You know, agrarian, the farmers of the community, they know what it means about sowing, so, sowing seeds. And so he's using their language, he's using their actual experiences to, to tell them a story that, that they would get. And certain people wouldn't get it, because they aren't agrarian or they don't, they can't get their mind out. So he explains it even deeper, especially to the disciples. But this sower that goes out to sow, you know, that goes out very specifically to do something. And these seeds that keep falling, they keep falling here and falling there and falling here and falling there. And then finally, the sower gets to the good soil and it starts to fall on that. Even before the sower sows, as soon as it falls onto the good soil. So this is something that we all, I love the, the explanation in the Pericope, the last part of it, because we see this in our own Christian journeys and in the Christian journeys of folks with whom we are in relationship and with whom we are in community. And I always feel that it is our responsibility to help people understand where they are and to keep moving them along to the good soil. We know those people who have heard the, the word of the kingdom and just don't get it. <laughs> they know what they should do, know what they shouldn't do, but then the evil one comes and snatches away what is what had been planted in their heart. And so there's that. Mm -hmm. And then there's those, those for those for, of us who have walked away from church and walked away from, from being who we are, this is our call to go out to people and say, you know what you learned when you were growing up. Come on, let's plant these seeds again, but come to the good soils, get off the path now. <laughs> And that's on rocky ground. Think about what's being sown on rocky ground. When you're, 
when you've got a lot of mess all around you and, and you hear the word and you think, oh my God, that it's something is seeping in. I get it, I get it now. And then you, you're like all happy. And we know many people like this. And yet it doesn't take root. And people try and it stays for a little while. But as soon as what they're doing for God gets called on and they get persecuted or they get made fun of, they're like, I don't have time for that. This is too hard. And oh, how many of us have our thorns are, are those are in that patch of thorns where we know the word, it has been planted and yet it doesn't yield anything because we're so worried about the things that choke us, like the cares of the world and how wealth chokes it. Mm. And nothing comes from it. And we are beholden though to become the good soil. Hear the word, understand it, and look at the fruit that it can yield. And I love the fact that it goes from 100 to 60 to 30. It doesn't matter. It's still a yield. It's still a helpful yield. The beautiful thing about fruit yielding in these numbers is that even if it's a hundredfold, think about how many new seeds come from a hundredfold. Then think about how many new seeds come from 60 and how many new seeds come from 30. So even if you only yield 30 pieces of fruit. Oh, the seeds that you can now lay. It's amazing what God can do. However little we have. And however much we have. And I think that's a pretty good thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any thoughts in the next four minutes? I think there's a pretty three or four neat categories of where we all have been at some time in our lives. And when we stay persistent and keep on keeping on, mm -hmm. we, finally <laughs> good so we finally become the good soil. That, yeah. That's why we got to keep bringing people back in so that they can hear the word, let it sink yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very, you know, I think it's kind of tough sometimes because uh, a lot of times uh, when they run into the persecution, which mm -hmm. goodness knows it's not easy to do. And um, I, this, I live in testimony for that on many occasions um, that, you know, it, it, you know, we don't like doing what's not comfortable. I mean, that's kind of the generation, we like the generation of it's not easy and not fast and easy to do and you know, works out right away, we walk away. And um, I think, you know, this speaks to that and, you know, and says, you know, again, that soil where they hear the word, but when they run into any kind of turbulence, they walk away from it. And so they don't get the yield. Yeah. And Linda, I love the point that you made, and I've always thought this about this, this scripture, is that this is also a lesson for those of us who are in church or who are churched or who claim to be, you know, go to church and blah, 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 and who, who are the good soil and blah, 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 blah. It calls for us to be patient mm -hmm. and bring people yeah. along to the good soil. Right. And to till them and to work with them. We become the sowers as well because the sower also has to till the field and pull away the rocks, pull away the thorns. Mm -hmm. You know, and we are called to do that. Don't be impatient with the person who comes to church and who then says, who you hear the word and then they go out and mess up again. So what? Right. 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 <laughs> or Don't walks be, away. This, right. Just or walks says, away. I'm never coming. I'm never coming yeah. back. It's too much this and there. It's too much you, that. You just you know. keep praying for that good soil. You keep, right. And you still keep pushing. I think we do that with our children, you know, and I, I mean, I find that that's a lot of conversation, you know, even. You know, you're raised in the church, 
Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, I don't find a, a church mm -hmm. family. I remember my mom saying it to me, you know, in Morristown. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was trying to find a church and I just didn't find the place where I wanted to be, where I really felt. And one day, one of my students just said, I have a great church and it's right here in Dover. It was Reverend Abel, never, never knew him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I went in and they, they, and they, I fell in love. They took my mm -hmm. two babies out of my hand and took them downstairs mm -hmm. to the nursery. Oh, that was it for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I just was mesmerized and that started me back. So you never, mm -hmm. you know, you never, you know, you, you never ever give up. I agree that, you know, mm -hmm. um, you never know when the soil is going to be fertile. You just don't That's know. Right. Mm -hmm. You just don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just don't know, but you keep plugging mm -hmm. even even with the persecution, which is no fun, by the way. But anyway. Mm -hmm. So, so being patient is both ways, huh? Yes. yes. For the person and for the, yeah, okay. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. It's very tough to be in that space. But, you know, you try to model the calm and peace that Jesus instilled in you and, you know, and you know still always seek that joy that he still blessed you even in the persecution yeah well i pray that we are able to hold on to the idea that there is grace for us as we continue to till ourselves to become good soil that we can grow through the persecutions yes Lord. and that those things that seem normal in our everyday world that we find that distract us from our purpose with Christ and our purpose with these authoritative teachings and understanding what they mean for us, that we may be able to ask God for the strength to just hold on, yes. not worry about those distractions, yes. not worry about things when they become distractions for us. Mm -hmm we may find the way to build the balance with our spirituality and with what we've come to understand it's God's joy in our daily walk, God's joy in the plate of food that we eat. And when we have the third helping that we may be able to push the plate away. <laughs> <laughs> right? But to enjoy the second helping. The second is good. <laughs> but to know, oh God, that we are beholden to keep continually giving you thanks for all the blessings that you give us, for all of the struggles that you bring us through so that we become firmer in the spirit and that the spirit will bring us, hold us and keep us so that we will have life and have it more abundantly. We pray, oh God, that you would help us to remember to stay in the word and to look at your precepts and your ordinances and your authoritative teachings, and that they may guide us yes. as a light and a lamp unto our feet in the pathways in which you will guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.